Welcome to Democracy Dialogues, a conversation we need to be having now about the state of democracy in the Americas. I'm Eric Farnsworth, your series host, and we're coming to you today from the Council of the Americas offices in Washington, D.C. Our guest today is Leopoldo Lopez, one of the best known and most prominent proponents for democratic change in his native Venezuela. Along with his family, including his courageous wife, Lillian Tintori, Leopoldo has been in exile first in Spain, after escaping from house arrest in Venezuela, and now here in Washington. His arrest and jailing in 2014 after leading street protests against the brutal Maduro dictatorship energized the opposition and helped reveal the true nature of the dictatorial ambitions of the regime. His fight for democracy and free and fair elections was memorialized in the 2021 movie A La Calle. Leopoldo Lopez, welcome to the Democracy Dialogues. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Take us back to 2014. That was a very difficult time, both in Venezuela but also in your personal life. When you led street protests, you were captured on the street by uh, authorities from the Venezuelan regime. What was your sense at that time? Did you have any idea what might be facing you in the months and years to come? Well, I, I, I did know uh, what was coming. Actually, months before February of 2014, there was a warrant for my arrest. Then they pulled it back. But that gave me the opportunity to think about very seriously about the scenario of going to prison. It also gave me the opportunity to talk to my wife about this uh, and to my family and to make a decision that I was going to face that scenario. And if I had to go to prison, I was willing to go. I was not captured, as you said. I turned myself in voluntarily. The regime wanted me out of Venezuela. They did not want me in prison. But I decided to face uh, the injustice of the dictatorship in Venezuela uh, and force what you said very clearly, uh, to shift the perception of what was happening in our country from a decaying democracy to clearly a dictatorship. It was not until 2014 that that perception changed internally and also from the outside. So I think that was an important contribution that we, that we did. And I, I'm talking about a very large we because it was tens of thousands of people in the streets at the moment. Um, and we saw the real face of Maduro with the repression, the killing uh, of protesters, uh, and the incarceration of tens uh, of people that happened all throughout 2014. And since then, up until now, it has continued. It was a compelling moment, right? The cameras captured the moment, uh, the international media saw it, your picture was flashed across the uh, international media, and I think it really did uh, change in some ways the perception of Venezuela, and it did help uh, energize further protests uh, in the streets. Those protests in some ways have become reduced a little bit in previous months. Uh, what is the reason for that? Is the momentum dying out? How can we recapture that? Well, I think there are two ways to answer that. First is that over the past 20 years we've seen cycles. So we've seen cycles in mobilization, street protest or voting, uh, and it, it, it um, has been very clear that when the expectations about change become present and very clearly presented to the people, people mobilize. But then comes uh, the moments of, uh, of less mobilization. But, but there are cycles. However, you ask me, what's the dynamic now? Well, the dynamic now is that the dictatorship has decided to um, repress at a level that we have never seen before. So going out and giving a piece of paper or doing a graffiti in a wall in Venezuela can take you to prison. And I'm not saying that hypothetically. That happened three months ago um, when a group of the young movement of our political party was commemorating the fifth anniversary of the assassination of Neomar Lander, who was a protester that was killed by Maduro with a sh shot in his chest. Uh, and their commemoration was just sitting in the place where he was killed and putting a graffiti with his name, and they were taken to prison. So uh, Maduro has increased tremendously uh, the internal repression, and this is a process that is very complex. It's not just the repression in the streets, but it's also the level of social control that the entire society is exposed to. 
social control that has been getting support from China, from Russia, social control that it's not only the conditioning of the people um, to uh, have access or not to the programs or, or the jobs or the benefits that are very few of the dictatorship, but also social conditioning through the manipulation of communications and social media. So it's very clear now that Maduro is not alone. Maduro is playing at a, with, a, with a global alliance of very mighty powers that have decided to confront democracy everywhere. And he is playing with an asymmetrical advantage, you know, the power of the state as well as the support of other uh, countries around the world against the people of Venezuela. That's a very uh, disequal uh, equilibrium. No, absolutely. I mean, if, if you look at it in numbers, is 80% of the people in Venezuela want change. But when you look at the real politic or, 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 or the, the, the weights um, in each side, you, Maduro, as you said, has the state, the military, the police, but also the non-state armed forces. So Venezuela has become a territory where the cartel de Sinaloa uh, is openly doing business, the FARC, the LAN, uh, the Wagner Group, uh, Hezbollah. All of this, we've been saying it for years. And for many years, we were thought as uh, exaggerating. Uh, people said, well, that cannot be true. How can you say Hezbollah or FARC uh, or Sinaloa cartel are in Venezuela? Now, it's more than proven that that is the case. So these are the, the, the tools uh, and the allies for the repression that Maduro imposes on the Venezuelan people. You talked a little bit about the cycles uh, of maintaining momentum in terms of the protest movement at the national level. How do you maintain your own personal motivation? This is costly. This is not easy. And for an individual and his family to go through this uh, exile and uh, personal cost and political uh, challenges, et cetera, what motivates you to keep going? Well, it, it's, it's a good question because uh, we all go through this uh, internal process as well. I, I think the, the answer to that is to be very clear about the, the purpose uh, about why we fight, I mean, wh what we strive for. Is it for just uh, being candidates or, or just to have a position? Uh, the answer to me is no. It's about freedom. It's about uh, getting uh, the dictatorship out of Venezuela. It's about giving the Venezuelan people the right to choose, the right to live under the rule of law, the right to have their rights respected. Uh, that's what it's about. But it's a lonely fight, I can tell you that. It's uh, many times you are questioned, uh, many times that there are no clear ways to go forward, uh, so you need to walk um, a very lonely road to, to continue. But there are many of us that are continuing in this fight, and they cannot um, be if you don't resign to wake up every day and continue to fight. Let's talk a little bit about that because one of the criticisms that you hear abroad, particularly in Washington and uh, elsewhere in the United States, is that the opposition is ineffective because the opposition is divided. That's something you've heard a lot. What would you say to people who lodge that uh, complaint against yourself or against other members of the opposition? Well, my first thought is that uh, that's a very easy excuse. Um, that's an excuse to put the weight on the complexity of the case of Venezuela um, on the opposition. I'm kind of saying, you know, they're not getting, uh, they're not being united, so until they do, uh, there is nothing we can do. I think that's an excuse, a dangerous excuse, by the way. My, th my second thought is that um, I've had the opportunity to meet with exiled and leaders from many other places where there is autocracy, people from Nicaragua, Cuba, Iran, Belarus, Russia, Cambodia, Hong Kong, um, and many other places, and this is the case everywhere. So um, everywhere where there is a, an opposition confronting the autocratic regimes, there are issues within uh, the unity of, of, of these movements. So it's a pattern, and, and it's, it's a condition that we need to deal with. Having said that, when I compare the dynamics of the opposition within Venezuela with other countries, we are much better off because we have uh, maintained presence. There is territorial presence of political parties, of civil society. Now, as we speak, 
there are protests happening in Venezuela, not only in Caracas, but in many of, uh, of the main cities, led by the teachers, by the nurses, um, by the public servants. So that, that is something that we need to take into consideration. But, but just to close this thought, I would advise those analysts and policymakers just to be very aware that uh, just saying that no advance is happening because there is no unity is an easy excuse. Don't fall for that. Yeah, yeah. It's much more complex. Uh, and there are many other variables uh, that need to be put into consideration. For many years, we alerted that Venezuela was a dictatorship. We were thought as uh, exaggerating. For many years, we said that Maduro was involved in narcotics, in organized crime, that he was building links with Hezbollah and radical groups uh, from all over the world. And no, we, we were thought as exaggerating and presenting something just for propaganda purposes. Now we know the truth. So that's what we are facing. It's not just a dictatorship. It's a criminal structure that uses the, the resources of Venezuela, oil, gold, now uh, cocaine trafficking, money laundering, to hold on to power. So yes, the economy in Venezuela has diminished um, almost by 80% over the past eight years. But the type of economy that, that uh, is uh, developing now in Venezuela is a criminal economy that gives a lot of cash flow to the dictatorship. Uh, and to understand the power structure and the political economy of Venezuela, you need to understand that criminal economy. You need to understand who's behind the cocaine business, who's behind the, the gold business, who's behind the oil business, who's behind the money laundering. And when you start getting the answers to that, you see that there are different clans, different groups within the power structure that they all share this organized crime business structure. Which is a tremendously complicated scenario you've just painted. So the question is, A, do people outside of Venezuela truly recognize the nature of the regime, number one, and number two, based on that, uh, what's the path forward? How do we begin to restore the democratic path in Venezuela? We know it's not going to happen perhaps overnight, but what are the steps that can be taken going forward from your perspective to address uh, this very complicated situation? Well, I think the first thing is to recognize the nature of the problem. Uh, and, and that might sound uh, as an easy thing, but when you don't recognize the type of problem you're facing, it's like a doctor that you know, does, that he tells you, this is what you have, and, and the only way uh, that you can cure is you know, with uh, a certain type of, um, of, of, of medicine or of treatment. Uh, but we need to recognize that this is the reality. It, it, it's, it's not just a populist leader. Uh, sometimes the case of Venezuela gets put in the quadrant that, you know, populist governments. No, no, no. I mean, that's not, you can even be a populist within a democracy. So we're talking about something completely different. This is a criminal economy led by a brutal dictator that is being processed by the International Criminal Court and um, that has links with organized crime all over the world. So recognizing the problem um, and, and understanding that there needs to be more and more information about that structure. So once you have a, a clear understanding of who's behind each one of these pillars of the, the organized crime, well, then you have the possibility of using the tools that are available for the US, for Europe. Sanctions is one of them. Um, the justice system is, is another. Uh, and I am a true believer of uh, pressure. Pressure internally, that's on us, but pressure internationally, that's on the US primarily. Uh, and I think the way forward, what, what you ask, is that there needs to be the buildup of pressure from within and pressure coming from outside. And creating that moment of internal and external pressure is the best moment that you can create for a positive outcome for negotiations. I think it's very gullible uh, and very innocent to believe that the, the way to build a good scenario for a positive outcome for negotiation is taking the pressure away from Maduro. It's giving uh, Maduro more leeway, it's giving Maduro more legitimacy, it's giving Maduro more recognition uh, in order for him to feel comfortable. Uh, that is not gonna lead to a good scenario for the negotiations. I believe in negotiations. I, will, I believe we need to go forward in, in that path, but the, the way in which an outcome towards the democratization in Venezuela. And let me be very clear. What we have been asking, not now, 
but for many years. I personally did a 28-day hunger strike. I lost 14 kilos for this. Free and fair elections. That's what we want. We want what Petro just had in Colombia. We want what Boric had in Chile. We want what López Obrador had in Mexico. Free and fair elections. And what we expect from the U.S. and from all of the countries in the region is that independently of their ideological position, that they support or quest for free and fair elections. We're coming to you from Washington, D.C. This is the Democracy Dialogues, and our host is Leopoldo Lopez, and we're talking about Venezuela. You know, you've discussed the issue of internal pressure, uh, which is a really important aspect, both internal and external. But the Maduro regime has done something that uh, is very cynical, but it's also very clever, hasn't, haven't they? They've created the worst humanitarian crisis in the modern history of Latin America, and depending on your estimates, at least six million, which is 20% of the pre-existing Venezuela population, is now outside of the country. So that's a humanitarian crisis, which he's not dealing with, the international community is left to deal with. But more to the point from the political perspective, it's somehow a, an escape valve, isn't it? So that you don't have people uh, necessarily staying in Venezuela demanding change, but rather leaving Venezuela because they're so desperate for food and medicine and jobs and that sort of thing. I mean, that's a pretty cynical step. Uh, to be doing that to your own population. What, I mean, how does the international community respond to that? So a, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, it's very important to understand that w the root of the humanitarian crisis is a dictatorship, yeah. is Maduro. Yeah. It, it's not the war or, or it's not the, uh, the, uh, an environmental disaster, it's Maduro. And that humanitarian crisis that has expelled almost seven million people uh, those are the, the figures uh, that, that we are seeing now, happen almost simultaneously to with a period where Venezuela had the highest level of oil fiscal income in our country. Let me repeat that. We are having a humanitarian crisis right after the largest oil bonanza in Venezuela's history. From, 19, from 2004, to 2014, the level of prices at moments, it was at $150 per barrel, and that created uh, an, an inflow of money that went to corruption, that went to petro diplomacy, that went to buy the votes of different countries within the continent uh, to secure the alliances for Maduro at the OAS and elsewhere. That was all through petro diplomacy. And right after that, we had this crisis, a crisis that has affected 95% of Venezuelans. According to different estimates, almost 90% of Venezuelans today are living under extreme poverty. These are not my figures. These are uh, figures of experts in the ground. Uh, and the, the um, reality is that Maduro continues to weaponize migration. So it has been in his interest to expel Venezuelans. So that means less Venezuelans to take care of with food, medicine, uh, and education. It also means that those Venezuelans are going to finance the Venezuelan family that remains inside. So we have between three and $4.5 billion of remittances every year coming from the Venezuelans who are outside to help the Venezuelans that are inside. But it also is being used to weaponize uh, in, in, in a way of creating crises. So we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. today. Well, many people might not know, but every day there are buses coming from the border that leave migrants here in Washington, D.C. Of those migrants that are coming from the south, more than half are Venezuelans. And they are part of this view of Maduro of using migration to create instability and to create problems uh, within democracies. And what's the answer to the problem of migration? Stability for Maduro? I don't believe so. Giving Maduro a break? I don't believe so. The answer to the problem of migration that is affecting many countries within the continent is political change in Venezuela. And you hear it, and I, I would recommend anybody who wants to see this in person, go to Union Station and talk to the Venezuelans 
uh, who are going down those buses and ask them, why are you leaving? And they will say one word, Maduro. And then they ask, when are you going to go back? Two words or three words when Maduro gets out. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, Washington is fixated on root causes of migration, particularly coming from Central America, but the root cause of migration, of, of an even worse migration in terms of numbers from Venezuela is the politics of, uh, of Maduro and the regime. And the point that you have just raised, I think, is fundamental. It's so frustrating for those of us who follow Venezuela closely because uh, the, the idea that historically high revenues coming in from oil uh, were simply stolen. Uh, and not uh, provided to the Venezuelan people in any meaningful way. Uh, and so this is, you know, gives a complete misinterpretation uh, of folks who say that, well, Chavismo is for the poor and, you know, it's, uh, socialism is the way forward based on, you know, we can redistribute the resources. Well, the resources were redistributed, but to the Chavistas. And so it's a very uh, uninformed opinion in some ways. No, no absolutely, absolutely. I mean, during the, the period of Chavez, I mean, he, uh, laid out with the help of Cuba primarily a, a propaganda and a diplomatic outreach just to present a mirage of what was happening in Venezuela. Um, let me give you some figures that I think are very important. When Chavez came to power in, in, in the year 1999, Venezuela was producing 3.6 million barrels of oil. The projection during the end of the 90s was that Venezuela by this moment was to be producing above six million barrels of oil. You know how many barrels of oil were produced this month? 500,000. That's a level of destruction that took place in the oil industry in Venezuela. But even worse, that during the moments of high income and high oil prices, the Chavez and then Maduro, they went out and, uh, to seek for debt. Uh, so Venezuela went for, PDVSA for example, went from a debt of $3 billion to a debt of $50 billion. And the same happened with the entire country. So it was corruption, mismanagement, uh, and the use of resources for political purposes or for the personal benefit and not for the people. Today, Venezuelans don't have running water. Today, most of Venezuelans don't have electricity throughout the day. They have blackouts one or two or three times a day. Uh, most Venezuelans don't eat three times a day. Uh, hospitals are completely broken. So you will hear people saying, well, this that I'm hearing now contradicts what I've been hearing over the past months, that is, Venezuela got fixed. Well, what happened over the past year, year and a half, is that Maduro dollarized. Without making it formal, the economy got dollarized. So who was benefit for that? Uh, who has been benefited? Small group of people. So Venezuela, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the, 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 the um, economic standard or comparisons, is 90% of people live in poverty um, similar to Haiti. But then you have an enclave of 5% of the people who are living a luxurious and, uh, and, and very wealthy life. And that's a, the, the part of the Venezuela se arregló, Venezuela got fixed, that some people look at. But the reality for the large majority of Venezuelans is that the situation continues to deteriorate. And to show that, we continue to have thousands of Venezuelans leaving our country every day. It's a deeply ironic result uh, after just barely 20 years of, uh, of Chavismo, you know, turning Venezuela from Latin America's wealthiest country into an economic basket case, which you say uh, portions of it are on, uh, on the same level economically as Haiti or Nicaragua. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's probably the best example of wealth destruction. Without a doubt. And, no, without a doubt, it's, uh, it's uh, unfortunately, uh, Venezuela over the past years represents the largest migration crisis in the history of the Western Hemisphere, the largest economic collapse in the economic history of the Western Hemisphere, and comparable to others in the world. Just to give you a sense of the type of decrease of uh, the GDP in Venezuela over the past uh, eight to 10 years, it's been 80%. Um, that is, in, not even Europe after World War II uh, decreased its economy to that level. Uh, and again, you talk uh, about root cause. The root cause is Maduro. The root cause is a dictatorship. So you cannot stabilize the root cause of this disaster. You cannot give legitimacy to the root cause of this disaster. You cannot think of the way forward sitting with the root cause of this disaster. I know we've tried 
many things. Uh, and, and in the case of the Venezuelan opposition, at least we need to uh, recognize that we've gone to the streets, not once, but several times. We've voted, we've lost, and we've won. Uh, we won two-thirds of the National Assembly. We've gone to negotiations. We've done everything, and we will continue to do so. But what we ask is that the site always remains in making political change towards democratization possible for the Venezuelan people. That's what we ask the American government. That's what we ask Congress. That's what we ask the American people. That's what we ask the rest of the continent. To be with, with us in our claim to have legitimate, free, and fair elections. In the couple minutes that we have remaining, uh, there seems to be a lot of hope, uh, at least in some sectors, about the uh, on-again, off-again negotiations uh, in Mexico, uh, or negotiations that the Norwegians sponsor, or you know, other formulations. Do you have much hope in a negotiated solution here, and how do we get to that point? Well, we've been through this uh, many different times, um, many different times, uh, and I think we need to be very careful. Uh, I think it's a mistake to put all of the, uh, the, the, the eggs in that one basket, to only think about the negotiation as, as, uh, as the only thing to do. Um, I think it's a mistake that might be very comfortable for other countries in the region, for other people saying, well, there is nothing else to do because they are doing their negotiations. Well, weeks pass, months and years go by, and there hasn't been any meaningful change. We support that that process um, remains, and we hope that something meaningful comes out of that. But again, we worry that that becomes the only lens through which we see the present and the future uh, for Venezuela. I think you made a very important point earlier on, too, in terms of the use of sanctions to support negotiations and not removing them prematurely to reduce the incentive for successful negotiations. I mean, it has to be a ratchet, right? If there's, uh, you know, if the regime is making concessions and showing goodwill, maybe you can bring down the sanctions a little bit, but if they continue to be obstinate, why do we talk about reducing sanctions? We should talk about increasing sanctions because there has to be that incentive structure for negotiations. At least that's what a number of observers would say. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, and, and I think that um, in order to produce any uh, meaningful outcome from the negotiation, we, we need to be very clear that we need internal pressure and external pressure. And, 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 and that combination is uh, what's going to make Maduro and, and his cronies to um, make decisions to go forward with negotiations. If Maduro is comfortable, if he has more legitimacy, if he has more funds, if he has no pressure, why would he negotiate? I mean, why would he uh, make a decision to open the democratization process in Venezuela? So I think we need to be very clear um, that sanctions are a leverage. Sanctions are not a means to an end, uh, but need to be used effectively. Um, and I, I believe that if there are no meaningful progress, there needs to be a reaction uh, with more sanctions, more pressure, uh, and um, Maduro needs to understand that there are, there are consequences for not following through with what he commits to in the negotiation table. There's so much more to discuss about these issues, but regrettably we're out of time. Leopoldo Lopez, I want to thank you, not just for joining us here at Democracy Dialogues, but for your leadership. Uh, leadership is costly, and it's not necessarily appreciated, the risks that people take, uh, but you are taking those risks, and I want to thank you for that. And those who are in a similar situation as yourself, uh, hopefully the next time we talk uh, will be soon, and hopefully it will be on the path to a democratic uh, future for Venezuela, which we all hope for and are working together for. Ladies and gentlemen, this will conclude our session of Democracy Dialogues with Leopoldo Lopez. We ask that you would please uh, continue to follow us, like us, share us, and uh, help build our audience on the important discussions of democracy in the Americas. Thanks very much. This is Eric Farnsworth signing off. Be well.